December the 9th of 2016 was just a regular cold winter's day in South Ogden, Utah. However, what would happen on that day was anything but regular. A young man by the name of Brock Van Komen lived along the 3600 block of Ogden Avenue, a residential neighborhood close to Weber State University. The house Brock lived in was similar to a college house, being composed of him as well as three roommates. He was related to two of these roommates, one of which being his brother and the other his stepbrother. That evening, Brock was planning to go bowling with a few friends, but wanted to grab something to eat beforehand. His stepbrother wanted to as well, so the pair went out and left behind their other roommates. Although they were only gone for 10 minutes, nothing could prepare the two for what would be awaiting them upon their return home. In the backyard, they discovered one of their roommates critically injured bleeding from a bullet wound in the neck. Inside, there would be an even more disturbing scene, as Brock was met with the lifeless body of his brother, as well as that of an elderly neighbor who would often visit the house. This is the story of Kyle Van Komen and Kevin Nelson. Kyle John Van Komen was born in 1992 to his parents Renee and Jerry John Van Komen. He had spent his younger years in the region of West Point in Syracuse, Utah, until he eventually settled down in South Ogden after high school. Kyle was well-liked in the neighborhood and was very friendly, often lending a helping hand to those in need, even strangers. In the same community lived another man by the name of Kevin Nelson, who happened to be Kyle's neighbor. Kevin, who owned an automotive and electrical repair shop in town, was known to make friends with everyone he met, and although he was 61 at the time, he got along very well with Kyle, frequently visiting him at his house. On December 9th of 2016, Kevin had been at the home of his lifelong friend and neighbor Sam Martinez until he decided to head over to Kyle's at around 7.30 p.m. Shortly after he arrived at 7.45 p.m., Kyle's roommates took off to get something to eat, leaving Kyle and Kevin alone in the house with the remaining roommate. The two then sparked up a conversation about what was going on in their lives, as they had done countless times before. Little did they know, however, this time would be different, as they were being watched. Unbeknownst to Kyle and Kevin, there were three masked gunmen outside of Kyle's home. They were caught on a neighbor's security camera, seemingly stalking the residents, lying in wait for the right opportunity to strike. Minutes after Kyle's roommates left, the intruders were caught on camera looking into the windows along the side of the house, observing the movements of those inside. The following moments weren't caught on camera, but it's presumed that shortly after scoping out the house, the three intruders made their way inside, where they proceeded to carry out their attack. Police were called to the area just before 8 p.m., and they immediately began their investigation. Four days after the incident, on December 13th, Police held a press conference in order to reveal some information about the case to the public and show the surveillance footage which was captured on that night. The police was asked about the surviving roommate as well, however, they told reporters that he wanted to remain anonymous and that he had not recognized the voices of any of the culprits. Police further mentioned that robbery was the motivation behind the incident, but they were absolutely adamant that this was not a random event. South Ogden Police Chief Darren Park said during the press release that, quote, this was not a random act. There was a specific intent targeted toward that home and to those people. But this left many wondering, why was that house specifically targeted? Investigators seem to believe that the scene of the crime may have played a hand in the shooting. The house where Kyle lived with his roommates had a reputation of being a party house in the community. Police had been called twice in the past year for ordinance violations and Park mentioned that the house was a known gathering spot for college-aged individuals to drink beer and smoke. As such, there were always people walking in and out of the residence at all times of the day. Police mentioned this fact, not to vilify the victims in any way, but because they believe the perpetrators may have been among those individuals who would frequent the house and knew the layout. What's also peculiar in the case is that, according to police, the perpetrators waited outside the residence for some time before entering. If so, however, they surely would have seen Kevin arriving to the house. This begs the question, why would they still have chosen to carry out the invasion knowing Kyle had company? Despite interviewing dozens of people and conducting a lengthy investigation, the police didn't come up with a single lead which might help them solve the case. 
Although they did receive many tips throughout the years, they never panned out, and all those who were suspected of the crime had airtight alibis. This story is as mysterious as it is tragic, and many think that there's more to it than meets the eye. To this day, however, this case remains cold, with no new information coming out since 2016. The disappearance of Marilyn Bergeron was extremely bizarre due to her strange behavior in the months leading up to it and the eerie CCTV footage which was captured of her on the day she vanished. Marilyn, who was born in 1983, lived with her parents, Andre Bouchard and Michelle Bergeron, as well as her sister Natalie, in a borough of Quebec City. Shortly after receiving her degree in media arts and technology from a local college in 2005, she would move to Montreal, where she worked as a sales assistant at a music store and did freelance sound editing for local TV stations. It's in Montreal where her story would take a turn for the worse. About three years after making the move in early 2008, Marilyn began telling her family that she no longer felt safe in Montreal and that she wanted to return to Quebec City. She did not mention what had happened, only that she had to leave at once. Upon her return home on February 10th of that year, her family would immediately notice a stark difference in Marilyn's personality. The happy and upbeat girl they once knew was now extremely depressed and in a state of constant anxiety. Marilyn's parents knew that she was having a hard time in Montreal, but didn't know it was to this extent. Despite their continuous attempts at trying to find out what happened to Marilyn, she just wouldn't say. Marilyn's mother Andre asked Marilyn if there was something she was afraid of, to which she replied that there was. Marilyn never mentioned anything else, however, and would instead only cry. Her mother would also state in a later interview that, quote, she was closed, sad, and nobody could get her talking. She wasn't the same anymore. Marilyn's friends would agree with this statement, claiming that she had not been herself in the year leading up to her disappearance. Jonathan Gauthier, a college acquaintance of Marilyn's who had reconnected with her in Montreal, also noticed how depressed she had become. In a later press conference, Jonathan mentioned that he attempted to get some answers out of her in late 2007, but claimed she wouldn't reveal anything. He asked her if she was harmed in any way or if she was witness to a murder, because in his mind, he didn't know what else could have caused Marilyn to change so drastically. She would flatly deny both. However, she told Jonathan that what had happened to her was much worse. She further stated that he could not even imagine what she went through. Marilyn's sister, Natalie, would also recall Marilyn's strange behavior in the week leading up to her vanishing, telling reporters that on a phone call a few days before she disappeared, Marilyn asked if there was a light at the end of this tunnel, referring to life. In retrospect, Natalie believed this meant that Marilyn knew ahead of time that something was going to happen to her. Early in the morning of February 17, 2008, merely one week after returning to Quebec City from Montreal, Marilyn told her parents that she was going out for a walk. Her mother, Andre, asked if she could join, to which Marilyn replied that she wanted to go alone. This was a bit odd to Andre as they had usually gone on walks together, but she figured that she was depressed and wanted some time to herself. Little did Andre know, this would be the last time she would ever see her daughter. When Marilyn failed to return home that evening, her parents reported her missing to the Quebec City Police. The morning after, investigators began following Marilyn's digital trail and quickly discovered that she had visited a bank close to her house at 11.09 a.m. where she was captured on CCTV attempting to take out $60 from an ATM, according to bank records. Her card, however, was declined. As you can see in the video, Marilyn was clearly distressed, looking over her shoulder numerous times throughout, making an expression which her mother would later describe as helpless. What's perhaps most bizarre about the video, however, is the black bag which Marilyn was carrying. Her parents stated that she had not been wearing it when she left home, nor did she own any such bag. The bag, as well as Marilyn's behavior in the video, led police to speculate that she may have been traveling in a car with somebody who provided her with the bag for whatever reason. 
This theory was further evidenced by the fact that the next and last location authorities were able to trace Maryland to was a cafe called Café de Pau in St. Ramon at 4.03 p.m. that same day. This cafe was roughly 25 kilometers away from her family home, and she would have had to cross a bridge to get there. As such, police speculated that Marilyn could not have walked there by herself, especially on a cold winter's day. Authorities later interviewed the barista that served Marilyn at the cafe, who claimed she was very depressed and looked anxious. The events of February the 17th left investigators, as well as Marilyn's family, with many unanswered questions. Why did she attempt to take out $60 from an ATM? Why was she carrying that black bag and what was in it? Why did she travel so far just to go to that coffee shop, and if someone drove her there as police suspect, who might they have been? Because the cafe was the last confirmed sighting of Marilyn and they had no other clues or information, authorities had very little to go on when attempting to answer these questions. There were, however, some strange developments with the case some years after Marilyn's vanishing. In December of 2010, an anonymous person called crime reporter Claude Poirier to report that he had seen Marilyn numerous times over the past year in Hawkesbury, Ontario. Hawkesbury is a predominantly French-speaking town located near the Quebec-Ontario border. The caller further mentioned that he had always seen her around with the same young man and that she always looked, quote, under pressure and captive when he saw her. While investigating the caller's claims, Police found that this was not the only sighting of Marilyn in Hawkesbury, but there had actually been 35 others reported. This was too many to be ignored, sparking authorities and Marilyn's family to launch an investigation in Hawkesbury. Quebec City Police looked into the reported sightings, but they unfortunately led nowhere. They did add another degree of mystery to the case, however. If it really was Marilyn who was spotted in Hawkesbury, what could she have been doing there? Who was the man she was with? And was he the same individual who police believe drove Marilyn to the cafe on the day she disappeared? What business did Marilyn have with this man, and why was she with him, seemingly against her will as per the eyewitness reports? Unfortunately, it's unlikely we will ever know the answers to any of these questions, as nothing more has come of the case since. Marilyn's family maintains hope that they will one day find her, even increasing the reward for any information regarding her whereabouts from $10,000 to $30,000 in 2017. The Quebec City Police still attempt to gather possible tips from the public to this day by setting up command posts outside the cafe where Marilyn was last seen, but have been unsuccessful in finding anything. Marilyn's case is extremely perplexing, not only because of the mysterious circumstances which led to her vanishing, but the mystery after her vanishing as well. It's unusual for police to receive so many similar tips about a person's whereabouts following their disappearance, leading some to believe Marilyn may still be alive. The police not finding anything concrete in Hawkesbury, however, led others to believe that the sightings of her were just a matter of mistaken identity. But the question remains, what really happened to Marilyn Bergeron? At midday on December the 13th of 2009, a man would park his car at the end of a cul-de-sac in one of Nevada's most affluent neighborhoods. He then proceeded to exit his vehicle and walk in the opposite direction. The man would never be seen again, and the mystery surrounding his case would lead many down a rabbit hole for years to come. This is the story of Stephen Coker. Stephen was born in Amarillo, Texas to Rolf and Deanna Coker in the year 1979. After high school, he would attend the University of Utah, where he received a degree in communications. Shortly after graduating, Stephen worked various jobs until he was eventually hired for a position at the Salt Lake Tribune in 2007. He enjoyed his work. However, he wasn't a big fan of the temperatures in Salt Lake City, so after a year, he decided to leave his job at the Tribune and relocate to St. George, Utah. It is here where Stephen's troubles would start. With the onset of the Great Recession underway, it was very hard for him to make ends meet. He managed to find some work handing out flyers for a local window washing firm, but the income just wasn't enough for his expenses. By November of 2009, Stephen was already three months behind on rent and in a bad position financially. On December 7th of that year, Stephen's father Rolf called to inform him that he knew about the missed payments. 
Stephen was rather annoyed that his father knew about his money troubles, but assured him he had it under control. On December 10th, Stephen made an impromptu trip to his ex-girlfriend's parents' home in Ruby Valley, Nevada, hoping to see her. Her parents informed him that she wasn't there, and although they weren't expecting him, they still had him over for lunch. During lunch, Stephen told them that he was on his way to visit family in Sacramento, California. Strangely enough, however, Stephen didn't have any family in Sacramento, so it's rather peculiar that he would use this as an excuse. Three days later, on December 13th at around 11.15 a.m., Stephen had received a call from a member of his church asking him if he was going to make the service, which had already began 15 minutes prior. Stephen told him that he was in Nevada and that he would not be able to make it, however. This was the last confirmed conversation anyone had with Stephen. On December 17th of 2009, members of the Homeowners Association from the Anthem community in Henderson, Nevada, called the window washing firm where Stephen worked and informed his boss that he had left his car abandoned on a cul-de-sac road. They knew who to contact as the company's flyers were visible through the car's window and the number was on display. Following the call, Stephen's boss immediately informed his family. Worried, his family reported his disappearance to the police and rushed to the area where Stephen was last seen to conduct their own investigation. They handed out flyers and even visited hospitals, jails, as well as morgues, but Stephen was nowhere to be found. Stephen's family found it rather strange that he would have randomly abandoned his car in that area because Anthem is known to be a very wealthy retirement community, and he had absolutely no connections to anyone or anything there. This would not be the only oddity in Stephen's case, however, as his family soon found out. It was discovered that Stephen did not only visit his ex-girlfriend's parents shortly before he vanished, but he also went on a series of long road trips, which he told no one about. Phone records showed that at 6.45 a.m. on December 10th, Stephen had left his home in St. George and traveled about 300 miles to Salt Lake City. He then traveled about 100 miles to West Wendover, Nevada, before traveling another 100 miles to Ruby Valley, where he met with his ex-girlfriend's parents. After, he returned to Salt Lake City from Ruby Valley and then stopped in Springville, Utah, before eventually making it back to St. George. All in all, this whole trip was roughly 1,100 miles. The most bizarre part about the trip was the fact that Stephen never mentioned it to anyone, and it's unknown where he went or who he visited other than his ex-girlfriend's parents. Over the following days, up until his disappearance, he would continue to drive long distances to various locations for unknown reasons. But the strangeness would not stop with the road trips. Police discovered surveillance footage of Stephen on December 13th, the last day someone spoke with him. In the first angle, you can see Stephen driving his 2003 Chevrolet Cavalier to the end of the cul-de-sac, where it would later be discovered. Then we see him on foot, walking back in the direction he came from until he was out of the camera's range. It seemed as if his travels weren't done, however, as his phone would ping off the Whitney Ranch cell phone tower in Nevada at around 7 p.m. that day and it would later be tracked to the intersection of the I-515 and Russell Road near Henderson. It's assumed that this is where his cell phone died and consequently where Stephen's trail went cold. The Las Vegas Metropolitan Police did a thorough search of the area where Stephen's car was abandoned, canvassing houses in the area as well as using helicopters, all-terrain vehicles, and sniffer dogs in an attempt to locate him, but they were unsuccessful. Periodic searches were carried out in the months following, and a local dairy even put Stephen's picture on a milk carton, all to no avail. In April of 2010, a group of 70 was assembled to search the open desert south of the Henderson Executive Airport based on a tip from a private investigator. But this too came up empty. To this day, no one has ever heard another word from Stephen. But what could have happened to Stephen Coker? One theory is that Stephen had simply decided to disappear of his own volition. According to family, Stephen had been experiencing some depression before he vanished and he was also facing financial difficulties. However, the road trip and the location of Stephen's abandoned vehicle seem to reasonably suggest that there is more to the story. If he really wanted to disappear, he'd want to draw the least amount of attention to himself as possible. Why then would Stephen leave behind a huge evidence trail by abandoning his car in a wealthy community hundreds of miles away from his home, where he knew it would have been quickly discovered? Furthermore, why would he have chosen to go during broad daylight hours when he could have easily been seen? 
Many believe these couldn't have been the actions of a man that wanted to disappear. Also, a few days before he vanished, Stephen told his mother over the phone that he would be home by the 23rd for Christmas, and presents for his nephews were discovered in his vehicle. This seems to suggest that wherever Stephen had gone, he had not intended to go for long and wanted to come back. Many theories have been brought up over the years in regards to the vanishing of Stephen Coker, ranging from somewhat plausible to downright bizarre. Still, none have ever been substantiated and they remain only theories to this day. The string of bizarre activities before his vanishing, as well as the secrecy regarding what he was doing, added a degree of mystery to the case, which has attracted the attention of many. Despite this, however, nothing concrete was ever discovered, and Stephen Coker's case remains cold to this day. We can only hope that the families of the individuals covered in this video may one day find closure, and if you have any information regarding their cases, please contact the respective numbers on screen.